Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce our guest, Marat Atesh, who covers my beloved Winnipeg Jets for The Athletic. How's it going, Marat? Well, having a good one. Um, sunny autumn day in Winnipeg. Jets are in Dallas right now, and I'm not on this trip, so I'm just uh, just hanging out, getting some features that I'm excited about, kind of ready to go. Awesome. I'm, I'll definitely ask you about that later on at, uh, at the end of this podcast. But um, uh, what I do every time um, with our guests is just ask a little bit about how you started in sports journalism and writing. And for you, when did you first think you might want to pursue a career in, in sports journalism and writing? Uh, this is going to sound absurd, uh, but I first thought that I wanted to pursue a career in sports journalism the day I emailed Myrtle to inquire about working at the athletic. Wow. Wow. Um, I can make that make more sense, but yeah. <laughs> um, I, so I, I didn't go to journalism school. Um, that was not the established goal growing up. Um, I was a hockey obsessive. I played it growing up. I, um, you know, played high school in Toronto, not a, not a crazy level. It wasn't one of those stories, but I loved it so much. I, I think my first blog on the internet when I was learning what the internet was in the 90s was about hockey. You know, that was kind of always going to be the thing. Um, and then it was it was 2004, 2005, the lockout year where um, so I have family roots. We, you know, my parents immigrated to Alberta. We were big Oiler fans. I just maintained the loyalty when I was growing up. And that year, I was moving into an apartment with a buddy of mine, another big Oiler fan. We were so excited to, you know, have center ice and watch all the games and all that yeah. stuff. And of course, there was no season. So we turned online. We went to Hockey's Future. We found blogs. We went all those different routes. And at that time, for whatever reason, some of the first people doing like a real push into hockey analytics were all Oiler fans. Okay, interesting. Um, I don't know if you remember during like 2014 summer of analytics, there was a couple of pieces by I think Elliot Friedman was one. Um, okay, maybe Bob McKenzie was another. I, I'm not sure if those are the right names, but they were doing a who is Vic Ferrari uh, post. <laughs> They're trying to like wow. figure out who this guy was, and who he was. His real name is Tim Barnes, and now he's the director of analytics for the Washington Capitals. Wow. He was this guy that was an Oiler fan who went online in 2004, 2005 and used his like investment experience, his coding skills, all of this sort of stuff to write these pieces that blew the minds of, of Oiler fans. So it was like, you know, who do you think plays the most minutes against Joe Thornton every night? And I don't know, Eric Brewer is famous. What about him? <laughs> well, no, actually it's Steve Steos and Jason Smith and here's all the data. And I just remember that you're, this is a long story, I guess, but it just blew my mind so many times that every time somebody wrote on these topics on the internet, I'd like, I'd follow them to the blog and I'd comment on their site or I, I do all that sort of stuff. And so I had sort of pursued it as a hobby mm -hmm. alongside, I worked at the University of Manitoba. I have an environmental science degree. I work in international, in the International Center for Students because I have a lot of passion for international things as well. Um, and I never thought that it was going to be my 100% mainstay until the athletic came to Winnipeg. And I thought, oh, man, like, what if? And then I was lucky that Myrtle gave me a shot. So just to kind of go back from 2004, I guess, and you, you, you mentioned kind of being on analytics on the Internet and, and reading that stuff till 2018. Were you blogging often? Like, how did that kind of, were you writing a lot? Like, just maybe talk to how you came from 04 to, to 2018, working at The Athletic. For sure. I mean, the first couple of years of that um, was at the message boards on hockeysfuture.com, where anytime somebody, you know, this included this Tim Barnes fellow that was a pseudonym at the time, uh, who works for the Capitals now. It included Tyler Dello, who works for the New Jersey Devils now. There were some real, you know, like old school analytics, early adopters types. And I would just comment on anything that they wrote. If, if somebody had a different theory about why hockey was played a certain way, I'd sort of try to participate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then that led, I'm going to say 2007, 2008, kind of in that time, I'm still a student at the U of M. Um, 
and I asked Tim Barnes if I could blog or write some posts at his site, which was called Irreverent Oil Fans. <laughs> and irreverent, like, you know, non-worshipping, non-whatever, you know, just tell it like it is, look into it, do the data sort of thing. But to be honest, I mean, my biggest contribution was, you know, asking questions when they posted stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that I was doing mind-blowing analytics work myself, though I would track certain things and I would and I would write posts at this site. Sometimes I'd write humorous posts. Sometimes I would write all sorts of different things. Um, and then when he got hired in 2013, 2014, somewhere in that neck of the woods by the Capitals, because this Tim fellow is just an incredible person in that regard. Um, he had this whole non-disclosure thing and his site got taken down and all of this stuff, it like got peeled from the internet. And that worked in my favor because Myrtle was an early, James, I say Myrtle and if anybody's not listening, yeah. James Myrtle, um, you know, editor-in-chief of The Athletic in Canada um, was an early adopter too. So he was writing, I think about the Maple Leafs at that time but he found this analytics site that I happened to guess at. Um, so, you know, I mean, that only fills in part of that gap there, I realize. But when I came knocking on his door in 2017, when I uh, was like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity in Winnipeg, maybe I can write a few things. I used to write at Irreverent Oil Fans. He's like, whoa, Tim Barnes is a blogger. Are you serious? Like, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and it sort of opened the door for the conversation. Meanwhile, the previous years to all of that, I mean, I was writing travel stories. Hmm. I was, uh, you know, I was writing these like 30 page travel books that I would sell for $10 and then hop on the train in Europe. Like I was really trying to make writing be a thing, even though it wasn't my training. Hmm. Um, and it didn't have, I mean, those little books gave me the idea that maybe I could buy a meal every now and again, but the idea that it could be my job still I mean, 2017, that was just good fortune. I guess I, I want to ask you a bit more just about writing. Was that something as a kid that you always loved to do or did it almost evolve as you got older? I loved it as a kid, for sure. Um, I grew up in a town, it's called Penawa, Manitoba, that was famous for nuclear research. Okay. Um, it's like, it in Manitoba, most towns are farming towns. People went there for, you know, because it was at a convenient location or um, it was the central meeting spot of different farms or what have you, communities build up. Pinawa was built in, out of the bush and established by the federal government as this nuclear research town, mm -hmm. which I say because everybody there was like the kid of a scientist. So I was so, I was into math. I was into science. I took these like special trips to the nuclear research lab because I was a science geek and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I remember like, my first bits of praise from a teacher that are really sticking in the back of my mind are like, oh, uh, you know, Murat, can you read this paragraph from that story that you wrote? It, you know, I want to share this as an example. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm into that. Or like writing was, yeah, a big passion for me since I was a kid. I just never really realized coming out of that background and I was you know a math nerd and a good uh, in that way I think it was always assumed I would go into engineering or science or something like that it just never occurred to me that this thing I loved you know not until adulthood at least could be what I also did every day yeah and so how, what was that feeling like when you applied to the athletic and you got that job like that must have been did that almost feel like a dream come true I would, I would put it in, in that regard. Um, so fall 2017, um, here's content. I, I over contextualize everything, um, I don't know. but get me out loud. So, you know, not in print. So you get extra info, um, fall 2017, um, what was happening in my life was I spent six months kind of on the IR, so to speak. I'd had a head, head injury, mm. um, some post concussion issues. And like a real, okay, let's evaluate life sort of um, drive. Uh, for the previous couple of years, I've been writing these travel stories. Like I say, there was this sort of realization that this hobby of mine that I was doing outside of my nine to five, which was at the University of Manitoba, this hobby might be a passion. It might, you know, like I say, pay for a meal every now and again. But I remember specifically summer 2017 going for you know, a 20 meter walk and being dizzy and having to like mm -hmm. sit at the side of the road 
I called my dad. I'm like, dad, this sucks. He's like, yeah, it does sound like it sucks. I'm like, dad, when this, when I get out of this situation, writing is the thing. It's got to be the thing. Mm -hmm. And then progressively, I started to get a little better. Like I could do more of my day to day in a really good way. And the timing of the athletic coming to Winnipeg and not just coming to Winnipeg, but having an open call, which it didn't do in most cities. Usually it knew exactly who it wanted, had a deal arranged and all that. Um, that was really special that Myrtle knew of my blogging from like a decade earlier was really special. Mm -hmm. And then like this, this other thing is there's this writer that I really admire named Pat McLean, who I'd sent him one of my travel books. I went out for beers with him in Toronto a couple of times over the years. Turns out he played beer league hockey with Myrtle and was able to tell him, I was like, Hey, I'm applying to this thing at the athletic. Um, any chance you could say anything He's like, of course I can. One, I love those travel stories. And two, like I can vouch that you're a decent human being and mm -hmm. as well. So I thought the confluence of all of those things was really special. Um, the opportunity to go straight to the NHL because people pay dues, years, you know, minors, AHL, like juniors, all that sort of stuff, J school, all that time. And like, that's just so fortunate to be able to do that. And then like, like my healing wasn't a straight line and Myrtle basically said, okay, you know, what are your pitches? And I had this thing about, we'll, we'll use analytics to project how much Patrick Liney is going to score this year. And he said, great, we'll see how that one does. Mm -hmm. And that one did well. And a few weeks later, it's like, okay, we got room for another one. So it wasn't like I was leaping straight into full-time work. It, okay. was, it was this ongoing audition and looking back, it's so special because that was basically also the path of my healing. Like by January, when it was huh. quite as much as you want, it was, I was back to most of a hundred percent in terms of post concussion stuff. So everything, every last little thing about it is like, yeah, like I'm so, so lucky. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, um, I, d I wanted to talk a bit about how you, mentioned about the analytics with with line a and projecting goals and um i think like uh he just got me with that story like you're an amazing storyteller as you just told us your story of how you became a writer at the athletic and when you were writing those stories about analytics were you focused on telling the story of the analytic itself or how do you kind of make it engaging for readers analytics i guess yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And, you know, it's not every day that you tremendously succeed on that front, right? Because some people will see numbers or, you know, if you throw up a graph and don't have context or narrative around it, you know, some people's eyes just glaze over. Um, and I think the advantage that maybe I had had coming from a non-traditional background where I was writing these, you know, this story about this time I met a photographer in Ireland who did this, that, and the other thing is, like there's this extreme need for people to understand like why does this number mean anything like what is the narrative what is the story that i'm going to process this through and i think i was really conscientious especially early being like anything that i'm gonna you know from shot attempts to like to let's talk about zone exits or like simple things that maybe people weren't used to reading about in the market. You'd have to explain why you track it, why it's important. You tie it to something that was happening in the jets um, with the jets at the time. Like I remember, I don't know how, if your memory for the 2017, 18 jets, how like, you know, each season goes, but around Christmas time, Mark Shifley was hurt and he missed 16 games. I was so. at that game. I think. Yeah. Yeah. When he got hurt. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. He goes down in the corner. Yeah, okay. That's yeah, yeah. Um, so for the next little while, you know, it was Brian Little, Matthew Perot, and Nikolai Ehlers who played the most minutes at five on five. They became the first line, um, even though there were other, you know, more famous guys, Line A, Wheeler, et cetera, on that team. But it was Little Perot and Ehlers playing so much. And so the question was, why were they good? Like, what were they doing? And at that time, zone exits and zone entries were being made public, attracted by Corey Schneider at, uh, at all three zones is the name of that. And so I talked to Nikolai Ehlers about what he does in the neutral zone. And I talked to Brian Little about um, 
you know, about how his wingers were helping him transition the puck. And so you had on like this micro level, this analytic, if you want to call it that, or this stat that people weren't super familiar with reading about. You had Winnipeg's overall success. You had the guys who were known for that success, Ehlers. I mean, he was he's a one-man zone entry. Um, like, and if you could tie it to uh, hold on. The specifics of the stat, the specifics of the line success, the specifics of the team success, how that fits into Mark Shifley's absence, and then the rise of the Winnipeg Jets overall in the league that season. That's a lot of layers, and it's like okay, now I care about this. It's not just a chart. Um, mm-hmm. It has a basis in something I can connect to, or at least that's what I hope. I hope to give, mm-hmm. I hope to only use data when it serves a connection to a thing. And and has that, I, I guess, has your approach stayed consistent from 2018 to today? Like, do you find the way you write is very similar? Have you learned a lot? Just, I guess, just going off that. I think that one thing that I did especially well early, like I think the answer is usually I've refined my practices, I've gotten better. But one thing that I I really think I did a good job of early was I knew that some of this stuff was new. So I'd always contextualize. I'd always offer the why of it. Now I feel like I have an established readership a little bit more, but it's still growing. So there's still new people showing up. And I think that it's important to, to, you know, remind why these things why these things matter like why don't i use plus minus because shorthanded goals count because empty net goals count um if i just say short if i just say plus minus sucks um that doesn't help anybody maybe you were here two years ago when i gave that argument but if you've just signed up at the site or you're reading this for the first time some of that context matters um so that's one way that i think that maybe i've changed um you know or that I think I need to to pay attention to the success of the the early stuff, and then also I think just as my scope at the athletic has changed, I'm not just like just in quotes like the analytics guy, right? I think I write feature stories, and you know that door has been wedged open where I can tell stories about Josh Morrissey and his dad, or I can tell you know about Adam Lowry getting progressively more involved in the community, or or whatever else that is so i think my approach has been also to recognize that you know even if i'm doing a good job of using analytics in certain contexts not every story can be that it's not all analysis like people are at the heart of everything like we connect to the players as people we connect to like the team whose stories we know right like you're a diehard uh, of the of two teams of the Jets because I'm sure you connect to the community and the stories you know the plot and like I think that um, trying to expand myself into making sure that you know a large part of my work is also on that front is another way that I've changed and I guess to go on how you approach journalism I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Hockey Canada and and obviously there's been a lot of serious news in hockey and, and sports and I think, I guess my question is, does there need to be more of an onus on sports journalists to delve into these stories? And how do you approach um, these kind of stories of abuse or other such things? I mean, yeah, great question. Um, I haven't personally written on Hockey Canada. Um, I think that, you know, the real, like, excellent coverage rick westhead at tsn katie strang at the athletic ian mendez at the athletic you know there's some real heavy hitters who have like a level of i want to say expertise and experience with you know what's a delicate matter and i think that they're really leading in that regard so when it comes to that stuff i think one thing i can do and do a better job of than i am like you know, they must write so many stories. What proportion of those am I sharing out into the world and trying to amplify their voices? It's not a hundred. It's it's some. It's greater than zero, obviously. So mm-hmm. I think my role in that regard is to is maybe to respect that and um and amplify those voices a little bit more. At the same time, like at the same time, it's such a huge story. It's such a huge story. And you know, Hockey Manitoba is a subsidiary of Hockey Canada. And, you know, almost every Canadian player on the Winnipeg Jets has gone through Hockey Canada, has represented them. And 
there's different angles and different connections to uh, to Hockey Canada. Um, you know, I was in a scrum about a week ago where John Liu asked Josh Morrissey um, what he thought about it. And not everybody's willing to talk about it. Like you heard some pretty vanilla comments from Connor McDavid a couple of weeks ago. But Josh Morrissey said, yeah, you know what? This is a black mark. It's a black mark on Hockey Canada right now. And mm-hmm. I hope that whatever changes are necessary um, get made. And I don't know what those are, but it's clear that we can do a better job for kids. And I thought that that was very good. So I, you know, I tweeted those quotes and I shared them as much as I could. Um, I think, I think that there is, there is a responsibility in journalism to to dig into the things that some of these organizations don't necessarily want to be made public because if you're only writing off of PR statements, you are doing PR. Like it's not journalism if you can't dig into things and ask questions about all sides and mechanisms and manners of how something works. And I think that, for example, in Winnipeg last year when Kevin Shoveldayoff was tied he was the, an assistant general manager with the Chicago Blackhawks during Kyle Beach's time there. Um, you know, you couldn't just report what Shevel Day and Mark Chipman said. You also had to read the legal documents and you had to go into the testimony and um, go into Kyle Beach's testimony and all, all those sorts of things. And um, I did my best on that front to be sure. And I think I did a pretty good job of it. But at the same time, too, in my own career, that's one of the first and most significant um situations there so you know i think that we did a good job and i think that you know when things like that happen and this is something that we've done we've spent time you know asking how could we have done a better job and i've spent time with editors on that too um so then just me thinking out loud i don't know if that answered exactly what you asked no no i i think i was gonna ask about the the kyle beach and and obviously how it affected the jets organization and um you touched upon it so i think um that's been really cool chat about your career and i just wanted to to move now to the team you cover all the time in in the winnipeg jets and let's start off i wanted to first ask you about their off season um there's Plenty of rumors with Wheeler, Dubois, Shifley. Were they going to stay? Were they going to go? Um, Wheeler obviously got stripped of the captaincy during training camp. So just what were your thoughts on their offseason? And would you describe it as a successful one? Oh, yeah. Good question. Um, my thoughts, let's see. I think the start of the offseason that everybody would point to if you follow the Winnipeg Jets, or I should point to if you're listening and you don't follow the Winnipeg Jets, is the May 1st, you know, exit interviews that, you know, Paul Stastny said some strong words in, Mark Shifley said some strong words in. And that's kind of where um, where the idea of a tumultuous offseason really took off. And, you know, Winnipeg had struggled badly down the stretch um, multiple times. Many of their star players, Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Pierre-Luc Dubois, Paul Stastny, Blake Wheeler, they're saying things like, we're not necessarily playing for each other or, you know, they question their own team commitment to 200 foot play. And there's this sense that things are falling apart a little bit at that time. And Mark Shifley is asked um, about his future in Winnipeg. And he starts his answer by saying, Hey, I love it here. It's the only city I've ever known. This is a special place for me. I don't know if these are the exact words, but the point is that Winnipeg was important to him. But then he also says, well, I guess I need to, you know, sit down with my family, talk to my agent, figure out what my future, what's best for me in my future. And that's a bit of a stunning thing to say on May 1st when you have two more years left on your contract. And that began a news cycle that essentially asked the question, is Mark Shifley on the way out of Winnipeg? And I don't think Winnipeg got too far down the road of shopping Mark Shifley or any of that sort of stuff, because what happened the next day which Shifley spoke to Kevin Shoveldayoff and, you know, management, ownership, all that sort of stuff in his exit interview with the team. And from what I understand, that was a long conversation. That was an intense conversation. Everything was on the table. And for Shifley, I'm imagining that helped put him a little bit more at ease to be heard. Um, For the organization to hear that, I think that was important. Either way, whatever exactly came out of that, 
what came next was Elliot Friedman reporting, hey, Pierre-Luc Dubois may not be interested in signing Winnipeg long-term. And well, hey, if you can't keep Pierre-Luc Dubois long-term, you're sure as heck not trading Mark Scheifele, right? So that became an issue. And, you know, we know in the end, Dubois signed his qualifying offer for just a year. Um, that turned out to be true. You know, I did some reporting, which essentially shared this, the same thing, that long-term was not necessarily Pierre-Luc Dubois' goal. There's this chance that, you know, he would like to play in Montreal long-term, test unrestricted free agency as soon as he can, which could be as soon as two years from now, as long as he signs these short-term deals. So that, from Winnipeg's perspective, won't be a success. You want that contract to be six, seven, or eight years long. It is a success because you weren't forced to trade him. You still get to return him to your roster, and he's such a good player for you. Um so there's a little bit of a to be continued, I think, when it comes okay. to him. And then with Blake Wheeler, I think they sincerely did try to shop him. And, you know, with his contract being so expensive, 8.25 million, uh, with the thought that he's declining at this age, that's a tough, that's a tough sell. Ultimately, I think that they got the sense they weren't going to get a good deal or might be asked to eat money on it. And that wasn't palatable for anybody. So they brought everybody back, took the captaincy from Blake Wheeler um expanded the leadership group to use the uh, the euphemism the team's been using but there's a sense that the cultural shift needed to happen and that Blake Wheeler could be a part of it if he was willing to take a lesser role and it seems like everything's going well on that front so the offseason hunted a lot of problems to the future like Shifley's still on track to be an unrestricted free agent two years from now Wheeler the same Connor Hellebuck the same um, Pierre-Luc Dubois, all he has to do is sign his qualifying offer one more time or file for arbitration this summer. He could be an unrestricted free agent in 2024. But it brought back talent to the team, gave it one more shot at contending for the playoffs and all that sort of stuff. And I think that the biggest thing, and I didn't realize it at the time until we saw his impact at training camp and the way Winnipeg's been playing, you know, at all of their practices through preseason, was that Rick Bonus hiring. As disappointing as it was, given that uh, Barry Trotz was on the table. Can I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But Rick Bonus has been, you know, I think a, a really impressive signing and has kept all of these moving parts together. And so far, one game into the season, two games tonight. I'm not sure when you're, uh, I, you're yeah. facing this. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the listeners, uh, it's Monday, October 17th. They Winnipeg plays Dallas uh, tonight, and I'll be releasing it tomorrow morning. So uh, that'll be in the past. But yeah, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about Rick Bonus. Like you just mentioned how um, impressed you've been. Like, why has that been? What's what's he really brought to this Jets team this year? I think day one of camp, I saw him teaching the neutral zone systems and shape of the four check and could tell that he was teaching them well and that they were organized. And not only that, but... Um, the fact that this was his choice for day one's work was significant to me because if you look down from press row at the Winnipeg Jets on the ice last year, when they were defending a team's breakout, oftentimes you'd ask yourself, like, what's the shape supposed to be? And they weren't committed to it. There was a real lack of, and this is why they were calling themselves out and certainly why they weren't winning a lot of games either, but there was a lack of 200 commitment foot commitment from a lot of players. Um, you weren't getting back checking coverage from from forwards, including star players like Mark Shifley, I'll say. Um, and, um, you know, defensemen were getting confused about how much support they had and where to put pressure. And, you know, there was a decided lack of, of organization. And I wrote to that effect at the time to see, you know, day one of camp that there's more shape than you're used to. And then you watch in preseason and you look from press row and you look down and you're like, yeah, that's a 2-1-2. Or, okay, the other team went D to D, so here's how the pressure is going to change. It's like, okay, this is this is a coach addressing what needs most to be addressed. Um, it took courage to take the captaincy from Blake Wheeler. And from all the reports that I hear, you know, Wheeler's been a great soldier about it. It's okay. got to be tough. Yeah. But you hear You hear good things about how that's being handled. Bonus had the courage to call out Mark Shifley, Kyle Connor, and Nikolai Ehlers for their minute-long shifts at five-on-five, five, not the power play, at five-on-five five early on in preseason. By the end of preseason, they were running 40 seconds. You know, there are these, like, 
basic hockey 101 things that Winnipeg got away from towards the end of last season and was a big part of their demise that needed to be addressed and would take courage from the coach and impact from the coach and buy in. And to hear Mark Shifley say, well, you know what? That didn't bug me to hear him say it at all because he said that to me first. Like we had that conversation before he went to the media. I mean, that's a that's a level of buy in and respect. And it has had the desired change so far, at least. So, yeah. So I wanted to ask you to to mention that. How would you say that that their gameplay and under bonuses translated into their first game of the season against the Rangers? Like, what did you like about their game and also maybe some stuff they need to improve on? Totally. I mean, for me, game one was a story of, you know, the first and the third period being played mostly the way Winnipeg wanted to. And the second period, there were some, you know, ambitious seam passes attempted. There was some pretty casual play in the neutral zone, a lot of giveaways. But what went well for them, you know, night and day from last year, you're getting back checking support from forwards um, when the other team's trying to break out. So Winnipeg's doing a better job of stopping teams from getting out of their zone cleanly. And if they can't stop them from getting out of their own zone cleanly, at least there's enough pressure from the back checking forward that a defenseman can step up, whether at the uh, at the offensive blue line, the red line, the blue line, they can step up because they know they've got backtracking support. Um, and that shuts down a lot of this transition play, gets Winnipeg headed back the other way. And I think that that's something the Jets didn't do particularly well last year. I thought that was improved. Another thing Winnipeg was able to do offensively against um, – uh, Rangers, Rangers, <laughs> New York Rangers. No, yeah. no, it's okay. Um, so New York was playing a lot of zone defense, and what Winnipeg was able to do was time cuts uh, from a forward into the middle of the ice, just as some of their better cycling players like Pierre Luc Dubois or Blake Wheeler or even Mark Shifley were making plays to get the puck out off the wall and into the middle of the ice, and. You saw Pierre-Luc Dubois go low to high, so from behind the goal line to the you know middle of the slot for Cole Perfetti. Perfetti just missed. You saw Perfetti find Blake Wheeler. Kind of Perfetti was passing across his body, and Wheeler goes in at the top of the circles. Shifley, Connor, and Ehlers were getting on to pucks first, and they were generating chances from the middle. And I think that when Winnipeg played with that structure in their forecheck and their, their forwards were tracking back and – or checking so aggressively with speed, they won a lot of pucks and then they had plans and they got into the middle of the ice. If you look at a heat map of the game, yeah. you know, Winnipeg was all over the middle of the ice. So that's what I liked the most from them, I would say. Um, and and th- some things that you think that they could definitely improve on, I guess, obviously you mentioned that that second period, but um, I guess that my, my other question, I guess, is do you think this team can be good enough overall defensively to be a playoff team um just in terms they were so bad last year defensively um do you think with rick bonus that that can that can change and they can be a mid lane or even better uh, defensive team i could see like defense is such a team stat It, it really is um and that's i guess a common sense thing you know you know one weak link can be a real problem defensively um, but also analytically, it's supported. Like if you move a player from one team to another, almost invariably his offensive impact comes with him. The amount of shots he generates, the type of scoring chances he generates. Um, hmm. But I've read studies where the amount of chances that the other team gets doesn't come with him from one team to another because it's such a team status based on the system. It's based on the buy, like the commitment and all the contextual things. And that for that to be separate, is you know uh, i'm still wrapping my brain around that but that's you know been yeah. compellingly showed to me and for like a common sense example neil pionk horrible defensive numbers in new york good ones for his two first seasons in in winnipeg and similarly jacob truba going the other way took him a while to start showing positive defensive impacts too because new york was a bit of a tire fire defensively um the year before pionk came over to winnipeg um so so can it be good enough? I think so. I think that when you're starting from as far back as Winnipeg was defensively, that there's a lot of grounds for improvement. There's still a lot of special offensive talent. Connor Hellebuck is still a special force. And you're starting to see things that remind you of the Jets from when they were good. Like one of the things they did well, but which is also something to be improved. If you remember the Dustin Bufflin era Jets, you always had 
Bufflin or Truba or Morrissey to a lesser extent jumping into the rush. And there's there's a play I can just picture, you know, a hundred times Winnipeg's three forwards are breaking out, you know, let's say Shifley, Connor and Wheeler, because that was the era. Then Wheeler in the neutral zone sort of pulls up and goes underneath the coverage. He passes from one wall to the other. Dustin Bufflin's on that other wing and he rushes into the zone. You've got four jets attacking that blue line with pace. And when you're going four on three or four on two at the line, you create more. It takes a lot of skating and commitment and all those other things. I saw Winnipeg do some of that stuff and nobody's going to be as good as Bufflin was, but you know, one play that led to a giveaway and some trouble, honestly, Nate Schmidt jumps into the rush um, in the second period uh, against the New York Rangers on Sat Friday. Um, and, and you've got this second layer, the second layer of offense. You've got the Jets attacking four on three, four on two at the line. The one instance I can think of, Schmidt tries a saucer pass that gets picked off. Hellebuck ends up having to make a good save. So there's a little bit of, okay, now that you're in there, now that you have numbers, do something with it. That would be a room for improvement. But the idea that the Jets are skating hard enough to outman the other team at their offensive blue line, but also the forwards are coming back hard enough so you're not getting outnumbered too, too badly, except for the second period. Um, <laughs> like that That's where you start to like squint your eyes and see reasons for optimism, I think. And I, I guess to go off that, I know for a lot of Jets fans, including me, Vinny, Vili Hanala, sorry, uh, has been kind of a, a, an interesting player and he was sent down to the minors. Um, would you think that he would add, do you think that they should, I know you've written that you might think that they should have him on the team, but would he really help that, uh, the Jets, sorry, I'm not phrasing this question perfectly, but um, get into those odd man rushes and really add to their offensive power? Um, yeah. Yeah, Billy Hamill is such an interesting case for me. Like when he was a rookie and he played those, was it five games? Um it been more. Yeah, it was it may have been more. You're right. I think yeah. it was more. Um if you're listening, uh look it up. But it was <laughs> it was some number of games. I, I think it was a little bit early for him in his in his career. And he actually put up a few points during that time, but those were, cool. you know, second assist puck movement type points it wasn't to be mistaken that he was already going to be a, a high impact player. Then a couple of years go by and Winnipeg has all kinds of opportunity to sort of develop him in the AHL, sorry, NHL and AHL at times that it missed. Like during the, you know, the taxi squad situation, pandemic shortened season where Winnipeg is running all kinds of pending unrestricted free agents, Nathan Beaulieu, in previous years, it was Anthony Botetto, Lucas Spiza, et cetera, players who Winnipeg was inevitably going to lose and whose ceilings were well-established as third-pairing defensemen, they sort of missed out on some opportunities to get Villa Hinala a few more looks, I would say, at that time. Um, was he ready for a full-time NHL gig? I'm not sure. We could have found out. But I think that it was a wasted development opportunity, not because he was guaranteed to come in and be better than those guys, but because Winnipeg was likely to lose a lot of them and Billy Hanel is supposed to be part of the future. The worst moment of that was he got called up for a month at one point during the taxi squad situation and didn't play in the AHL or NHL because Winnipeg wanted an extra guy on road trips. They had guys banged up a little bit and they needed to be in the same city as Manitoba to exchange players. That happened once in that month. They didn't exchange players. They never gave Hanel a, a, a game opportunity during that. So this young player misses a month of development time at a critical portion of his season. I didn't like that. They they haven't developed him in an ideal fashion. All of that said, at this particular training camp, to be honest, Alex, I thought Hanela would seize a job and not let it go. To me, to my mind, he didn't do that. Okay. You know, there were good plays. There were also plays where he just wasn't doing the things that he does well. There, you know, the puck movement, the first pass, the the breakouts, you know, some of those led to giveaways and, you know, a goal against in one case. Some of them led to some clumsy moments. And there's an argument that he needs to learn those lessons and figure out the timing and pace at the NHL level, which I have time for. But I don't think he was one of Winnipeg's best six defensemen. And yeah, would he help with that transition game? Absolutely, he would. That's his bread and butter. Um, I just think he needs 
And maybe that is bringing him up and accepting some growing pains that it's not going to look good for a little while. That would be a tremendous investment in the player. But I think he needs to show a little bit better than what he did at camp. And maybe Dylan Sandberg's ahead of him. Logan Stanley shouldn't be, but he's also ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I won't go into the semantics of the 6-7 battle um, for, on the Winnipeg defense, although I, I'd, I'd be very interested. I want to move a bit from uh, one young player in Vin- Vili Hainala to Cole Perfetti. I know you have a huge per, uh, affection for him, especially uh, I know you threw him off Pride Rock. Um, but uh, I one of your bold, uh, sorry for the inside joke, if you haven't read uh, um, some of uh, Murat's stuff, but uh, just you thought that he might be a Calder finalist year, this year. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give you the floor to explain why. Yeah, it's an ambitious call. And certainly of my bold predictions in, in that article, it's one that takes some things breaking right. Certainly, you know, Matty Beniers in Seattle, I think he's probably my out-and-out favorite. There's some thoughts that Owen Power could be the guy. Um, there's a pretty deep pack, I think. Um, but reasons why Cole Perfetti might find himself onto the podium, be a finalist for that Calder Trophy. Uh, first and foremost, pro, pro experience. You know, he has his AHL experience behind him. He has some NHL experience from last year as well. He's a couple of years older than a lot of his competition in that way. Um, you know, he's a January 1st birthday, so I think he's 20 right now. He'll be 21 in, in January. Um, that helps because it's not necessarily a who's the best player in his career award. It's a who had the biggest impact right now. I think that Perfetti has you know, quality of team matters so much. And if he's going to be in a situation where he plays with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Blake Wheeler in that top six and on that, he'll be on that second power play unit, it seems as though there's opportunity to put up points there. So he may not be able to take over games offensively like Matty Beneers can, but he'll have enough help, I think, where the point totals could be comparable at the end of the season. We'll see. Um, And the other thing that I like about his game, and this isn't the sort of thing that wins you awards at this level, is that I think we all know his offensive ability is there. He's great at slowing the game down. He makes the right seam play. He makes the right shot, the right decision, whether to shoot right away, whether to find another look, whether to make the first pass or find a second one. Like He makes plays that look dangerous. And even in game one, you know, there were a lot of those. Um, but he's been really good at the blue lines. And hmm. by that, I mean... Um, making plays that keep an offensive zone shift alive, you know, tracking back and winning a battle against somebody to then get the puck to a teammate. So Winnipeg stays in the offensive zone or absorbing contact to make sure that a breakout pass gets made and the Jets get over their own blue line. And for me, I value that a lot. I mm-hmm. value any play that keeps the play alive or controls what zone a game gets played in. And I didn't know that he had that in him. We'll see if that's a thing that happened a couple of times and, is a work in progress or if that's something he has will develop all that stuff. But I just, I believe in his ability to have an impact. Um, and I think he, he's in a great spot on that second line right now. I'm just curious, maybe has that translated in good defensive metrics for him? Um, in game one, not as much like what you, what you see in game one is that when his lines on the ice or you look just on Cole Perfetti's stat line, the shot attempts in both directions are roughly equal. Okay. And then the shots that actually made it on target were in favor of New York. And so this isn't necessarily a defensive thing, but I think that one of the reasons that happened is that I can think of Dubois behind the net to Perfetti in the slot. Perfetti misses the net. So that's not going to be counted as a shot on goal. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned earlier, Perfetti across his body, Wheeler streaking in. Actually, there were a couple of those. So this is a different one. This is a one time Wheeler puts it off the side of the net. That's a missed shot. Um, so metrics wise, shot attempts, he looked like a 50-50 player in game one. Um, shots on goal, he looked like he gave up more than he created. We'll see how that actually goes over a big enough sample. Because realistically, because you know, shifts happen, so to speak, you want 10 games of that. You want 200 yeah. minutes of that before you can say for sure that, hey, this is maybe going to last. Yeah. I wanted to, one last thought on a, on a, a young player for the Jets. I wanted to just ask you about, because I've been very surprised by him, is Brad Lambert. Um, obviously, he 
For people who don't know, he was drafted by the Jets 30th overall. He was probably ranked top 10 for most, uh, like coming up to the draft and kind of slipped at the end. What have been your thoughts about, what have you seen in his game? Because he scored a couple, I think a goal in the preseason, scored for the Moose, um, really young player. And, and what do you think about him? Yeah, I think when he slid, there was this narrative around Brad Lambert that like, maybe he doesn't have confidence right now. And, you know, he had minutes taken away from him on Finland's World Junior team uh, just a couple of months ago. And last year in Liga, in Finland's top league, he, you know, struggled to get minutes and opportunities. And his offensive numbers didn't look good at all. So, you know, I mean, that helps explain why he slid to 30th overall, to be sure. And there's a story that, hey, maybe maybe he's lost his swagger because he was a guy thought of as such a, an elite player once upon a time. Then day one at camp, he's going one-on-one -on -one with Josh Morrissey. And he's like, he's like trying to, it's not always working, but he's going at veteran NHL players and trying to beat them. And there's this sense of like of hunger to make a difference. There's a sense of confidence, of a real belief that he's going to create something when he has the puck on his stick. And so I don't think the confidence is an issue for Brad Lambert. I think that he needs to get into a situation where he's going to get a top six minutes, a lot of opportunity. And that's the AHL for him right now. He's going to have a good move season. I, that's what I think. I also think as impressive as he was at the Jets level, at this stage of his career, there's a bit of a tunnel vision to the idea that he wants to create each and every time he has the puck on his stick. There's a little bit of holding on to the puck, not using his line mates as well. You know, the defensive things that all young players come with. Um, and in that one preseason game he played where I think it was Calgary had a full roster just about, he was a little bit less noticeable. And so I think that he's a big win for the Jets at 30th overall. I don't have any qualms about him not making the NHL club. I think that was a little bit overblown. But in the AHL, what I want this player to do is I want points for sure. Like mm -hmm. the professional level and quality of defense that he's going to face is going to challenge him at times. He's going to need to learn a few different things. But ideally, what I what I, ho I would hope for is a best case scenario is he has hot streaks, comes back to normal, still gets consistent minutes. He has cold streaks, comes back to normal, gets consistent minutes. So these rigors, these ups and downs of the pro game, you know, the the goal would be that he gets used to those and that the aggregate of the season is, hey, here was a top six impact player, somebody that can be projected to eventually play that role at the NHL level too. Um, just I want to finish off a little bit about uh, what you think the Jets, what would be a good year for you for the Jets this year? Is it playoffs or bust? Is it... Um, even winning around, like what what do you think would be a good year for the Jets this year? I think the Winnipeg Jets need to make the playoffs to feel good about things this year. And I know they're coming from a ways back because last year was so rough and there were times when like, I mean, they won some games early, but by the end of the season, it, it really looked low quality compared to other NHL teams. And so they're coming from a ways back. They didn't turn over the roster that much at all. I mean, Sam Gagne in, Morgan Barron, full-timer, Andrew Kopp out, Paul Stastny out. That's a downgrade on paper in my mind. So uh, so it's I can understand why that might be challenging. At the same time, we talked a little earlier about things they're doing better than they did last year. Um, you know, Shifley and Dubois look dialed in. There's some opportunity for Cole Perfetti. Connor Hallibuck will be good. New coaching staff impacts. They might not make the playoffs, but they have to believe that they should. Um, and... I don't think that True North is interested in a rebuild, but at the same time, I also don't think that they're interested in spending a whole lot of money and missing the playoffs year after year after year. Yeah. So I think that this is kind of a prove it year for this version of the Jets core and that playoffs is playoffs is the goal. And I guess my, my, my question after that is like, this is more philosophical question to you, but what do you think the Jets should be doing? Like, do you think it's smart for them to, they're not going all in, but, making a push for the playoffs when they easily could have torn this thing up and become Arizona, which might've been smarter to, to get Brad up uh, to get Brad Lambert to uh, get Connor Bedard. Um, and so do you think this team kind of going forward, it should really try to become a cup contender and really go all in maybe next year with Dubois, Wheeler, Wheeler Shifley, Hellebuck, are they all, I'm pretty sure they're all UFAs in 2024. Um, or should they kind of 
stay middle of the pack or rebuild? Like what is your kind of take on what true North is doing with this team? Yeah. I mean, I understand the Connor Bedard thought and, you know, there's this worry that Winnipeg's entered an era of being in that mushy middle where they're too good for those really great draft picks, but not good enough to win it all. And that's, you know, that's a dangerous spot to be in if you want to win it all at some point as a, as a fan base, if you want to celebrate a Stanley cup, I mean, most teams, however good or bad they are, had needed those top picks. Look at Colorado, look at Tampa, Tampa Bay. There's some real winning draft picks in late rounds, but I mean, there's also Nathan McKinnon and Victor Hedman, things like that. Right. So, um, Steven Samkos, the, so there's there, I, I get that argument to be sure. In this exact moment, though, I think it would have been so hard for Winnipeg to go scorched earth enough to give them good odds at Connor Bedard. So, like, if you trade, um, if you trade Mark Shifley and Pierre Luc Dubois, you probably still get enough offense from Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers. You probably get good enough goaltending for from Connor Hellebuck that you're not down there with the Arizonas, where you're still beat out for that elite pick. And now, what are you doing? I mean, that's a tough spot to be in. Um, so I, I can understand the hesitance to tear it apart. It is clear to me that, you know, like you say, Hellebuck, Wheeler, Shifley, maybe less of a big deal, but DeMello, um, you know, 2024 UFA is Pierre-Luc Dubois on track to be one as well, though he could theoretically sign long-term before that. I'm not expecting it. Winnipeg needs that contingency plan that, you know, what is our plan beyond the 2024 year that helps us win in the Cole Perfetti generation and the Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers and Josh Morrissey veteran generation. And, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, there's some nitty gritty to get into, you know, how, if you extend Mark Shifley, how might that contract age? That could be a troublesome scenario. So is it time to try to do with Shifley what you did with Patrick Liney, which is, you know, sort of win a trade in that you're getting a really high quality player of a similar ilk that you can theoretically at least have for a longer period of time. I think that the pos the range of possibilities for what happens with the Shifley's wheelers, Hellebucks, et cetera, is wide. And if Winnipeg is genuinely going to go from this mushy middle to outright winning in the next few years, it needs, it needs to win whatever comes out of that, whether they re-sign these guys or move them for players who eventually help. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been really, really cool for me as a huge Jets fan and a big fan of your work. I just wanted to kind of plug you. What what, what things are you working on right now? Anything listeners should kind of keep their eyes or ears open on? Um, yeah, just. Um, so uh, going live Tuesday, as I understand it. So my Adam Lowry feature should be live right now. You know, as you know, he's a new alternate captain. He's got an A on his jersey. Um, the story starts, in my mind, in the spring when Mark Chipman pulls him aside in the hallway and says, hey, I've got an opportunity for you to get more involved in the community. Uh, do you think that you might be interested in that? And um, I'm not saying that ties directly to the letter, but there's a story about Adam Lowry getting progressively more involved in leadership. Uh, on Wednesday... I have a feature story coming out about Blake Wheeler. That's probably going to surprise some people. Okay, cool. I talked to teammates from like a decade's worth. I talked to family members. I talked to, there's a whole bunch of Blake Wheeler content that probably uh, folks won't have known before. And I'm so, I'm pretty excited about that one. I've got a Rick bonus story coming out. You know, I, I think this should be a fun week for, for feature stories just about the characters and personalities of the Winnipeg Jets. Well, I'm very excited to read the Blake Wheeler one, especially, um, and to read all of them. So thank you so much for coming on. I had a great time. And uh, yeah, um, behind the play listeners, uh, I have some other podcasts um, coming up. So stay tuned. And thank you again, Murat, for coming on. Alex, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.